I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome uh, everybody here today. Uh, I, I have this um, split public personality right now. I'm speaking to you, but we're also speaking to what we think are about 70 people from around the world who are joining us tonight um, via webinar. So I, 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 if, I'm, if I'm looking a little distracted, you'll understand that I'm dealing with that. Anyway, um, I'm Stephen Cohen, and uh, I direct the Berman Jewish Policy Archive at NYU Wagner, uh, whose, uh, whose mission is uh, dedicated to uh, furthering uh, uh, discourse on Jewish uh, policy matters. Uh, at the center is this uh, archive of over 4,000 documents that you can go to and download, and please do sign up to, our, to receive our, our, our newsletter. Um, and today we're very pleased to uh, welcome um, uh, Professor Adam Gameron, um, who's um, uh, an old friend of lots of people, including many people in this, in this room, uh, who've known Adam over the years. Uh, uh, in this room, we, we tend to know him as, uh, at least many of us know him as, for his contributions uh, in Jewish education, which for him is a sidelight. Um, uh, in, in, in his, for his day job, he's professor of sociology and educational policy studies at the, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and director of the Wisconsin Center for, educational, for Education Research. Um, his uh, areas of, uh, of uh, scholarly interest include the sociology of education for the conceived, organizational analysis, social stratification, and his research interests in particular include school organization, stratification, and equality in education, resource allocation in school systems, uh, some of which we'll be speaking, speaking about tomorrow in this very room in, a, in another, another uh, context. Um, uh, among his recent publications is a, an edited volume uh, published by Brookings in 2007 called Standard, Standards-Based Reform and the Poverty Gap, Lessons for No Child Left Behind, which is actually very appropriate. You knew to publish that book to get today's headline in the New York Times. Um, he's also co-edited a book with uh, our own uh, NYU's Richard Aram and Yossi Shavit of Tel Aviv University entitled Stratification in Higher Education, a Comparative Study. That was published by Stanford University Press. So Adam, joining you is not just the people you see, but um, if they've come through, we, we've had people who are, who are, who are coming, uh, who are on the webinar from, um, from London, the Jewish Policy Research Institute there. Um, uh, Marvin, I, I think there are you have colleagues from the uh, Gabi Chai Foundation, the Jim Joseph Foundation in San Francisco, um, the uh, AJ, AJWS, which just finished its board meeting, the Mandel Center at Brandeis, Jesna, and the boards of Jewish education uh, around the country, uh, to name just a few. Um, I'm sure there are others as well. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I'm going to give you Adam Gameron, and I will just get out of here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that warm introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I'm faced with two microphones, so I'm not sure which one. I might do some bobbing and weaving or just try to get in the middle. I want to express a special welcome to, to you who are listening to me on the web. Um, you can't see me, but you can see my slides, and that's the most important thing. Um, except that you also can't see my lovely blue and brown tie, which, which I picked up on the way over because I uh, opened up my suitcase and realized that I had left my ties behind in Wisconsin. But one thing I've learned visiting my son here in New York is that in New York City you can you can get anything you want anytime you want it in about five minutes. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. So I, I do have this lovely blue and brown tie which people on the web can't see but uh, but you can't you can see my slides and and that that's the best of me. Uh, so um, uh, Steve invited me to talk about uh, how the research I'm doing on education more broadly is uh, or uh, has implications for research that I've uh, been connected with or observed in the field of Jewish education. I'm very pleased to do so. Um, in general education, I've become very concerned in recent years over the question of causal inference. That is, how can we tell when something that seems to be a cause is really having Effect. How do we know the relationship doesn't go the other way around? Or how do we know that there isn't some mysterious hidden cause that's actually the cause of what seems to be the cause and the effect? So that's the puzzle. 
and it's something I've been very interested in in my work in education generally, and I'll offer a few comments about this topic for the field of Jewish education. Um, this topic of cause and effect is not lost on our headline writers. For example, is birthright Israel an intermarriage panacea? That's a recent headline from the foreword, and that implies cause and effect, right? It implies that birthright Israel is a panacea for the loss of Jewish identity, a cure for that uh, assimilationist disease. Uh, similar headlines have appeared in other outlets. A slightly more moderate tone was taken by Haaretz newspaper in Israel. This is the English edition, which said, birthright alumni found less likely to marry non-Jews. And you can see in that sentence a little more caution over the notion of cause and effect, right? Found less likely doesn't mean that birthright causes people to not marry non-Jews. It is an observation, a descriptive observation, that one group is less likely to do something than another group. Even more cautious is the headline in the Jewish world, birthright study offers mixed bag of results on Jewish connections. So sorting out issues of cause and effect is of interest in education more generally, and I think no less prominent in the field of Jewish education. Indeed, Israel trips, day schools, and summer camps, and other Jewish educational programs have often been touted as cures. Well, that's my term, term perhaps a slight exaggeration. But, but um, uh, uh, treatments that respond to the challenge of the intergenerational loss of Jewishness. Um, now, despite our um, interest in program, most have not been studied at all. And in, even those that have been studied uh, often use designs that are not well suited to answer questions about cause and effect. Now, I hasten to add, this phenomenon is not limited to Jewish education. On the contrary, it's common in education research more generally. Enthusiasm for untested policies is common in gener general education as well. For example, U.S. federal policy currently advoca advocates policies <clears throat> that lack evidence. A couple of examples are pay per for performance, where we would pay teachers or principals more if their students obtain higher test scores, or charter schools, where we set up a school with a specialized mission or focus and free it from the usual governance rules that fall on schools located within school districts. These may or may not be good policies, but they have not been carefully tested, although there was just a really good study of charter schools in New York City that shows some positive effects. But I can show you half a dozen other schools that show studies that show that uh, charter schools don't have such positive effects. So um, enthusiasm for policies, more research is needed to see if they're actually good ideas. Um, uh, perhaps the most um, important of these uh, policies that are strongly advocated without much research to support them is the notion that failing schools should be restructured. Education research, unfortunately, has provided almost no evidence about how to undertake such radical reforms successfully. The No Child Left Behind law, which we've been operating under since 2002, suggests that after five years of failing to hit achievement targets, a school should be restructured, fire the staff, reorganize as a charter school, um, adopt a, uh, a change program. Um, we have almost no systematic evidence on how to undertake such radical reforms. All we have is practical wisdom. Uh, there are no studies of restructuring programs that permit judgments about cause and effect. Meanwhile, educators can't wait for the study of cause and effect, they have to make decisions about what to do every day. Now, the U.S. Department of Education, through its, through its Institute of Education Sciences, IES, is trying to change the focus of education research to give us better answers about what programs and policies produce better results than others. Uh, there are really two parts to the Institute of Education Sciences agenda. One is to limit causal claims to research designs that support causal inference. So they're not saying there shouldn't be any studies except those that test cause and effect, but rather we shouldn't claim 
causation unless we have a research design that's suitable. And second, to encourage experimental and rigorous quasi-experimental quasi research with attention to causal inference. So if we adopt these two approaches, we would know more about cause and effect than, than we currently know. Now this change is not really about the method. Sometimes we hear education researchers complaining. They say the Institute of Education Sciences only wants to push experimental research. I don't do experimental research. They're against me. Well, that's not really what's going on. It's not a change having to do with the method. It's a change having to do with the question. The question that the Institute of Education Sciences is privileging is what education programs, practices, and policies are effective at raising scores, raising test scores, and re reducing achievement gaps, gaps between young people of different social and economic and language status. So what programs raise scores and reduce gaps? That's the question that the U.S. Department of Education wants answered. If the question is what works, it's clear that we need research methods that permit judgment about cause and effects. So this is not to say that's the only question worth asking. It's not the only question worth, worth asking. There are questions about values, questions about mechanisms, questions about um, choices of directions. Uh, all of these are important. But what the Institute of Education Sciences is trying to ask is what programs and policies work in raising test scores or reducing achievement gaps. And if that's your question, then you really do need a design that allows judgments about cause and effect. Now, why do we lack evidence about cause and effect in education? The reason we don't have much evidence about cause and effect is that we have not responded to the fundamental problem of causal inference. You'll notice that's in capital letters. This is a big thing. The fundamental problem of causal inference is that we cannot observe a unit in both the treated and untreated conditions simultaneously. So if a unit, let's say a person, undergoes a treatment and changes in some way, then we may want to attribute the change to the treatment. Oh, you had this experience, now you're different, maybe the change, maybe the treatment is what changed you. But how do we know the unit would not have changed in the absence of the treatment? Again, if the unit is a person and the treatment is some experience, maybe the change that occurred just had to do with maturation. Or maybe it had to do with some other experience that people having this experience also have. We can't tell if we just observe the unit in the treatment condition. But the fundamental problem of causal inference is that we can't observe the unit in both the treated and the untreated condition. So how do we know that the unit would not have changed in the absence of the treatment? Well, that depends on our assumptions. Now, if two different units are identical, we might infer causation. OK, here's two identical units. One got the treatment, one different, one changed, one didn't. We might want to infer that it was the treatment that caused the difference. But this also depends on our assumptions. In particular, inferring causation from a comparison of two different units assumes no selectivity bias. Selectivity bias means something unsystematic about, uh, it means something systematic about why one unit was in the treatment condition and one unit was in the not treatment condition. If there's something systematic about that difference, there's selectivity. And what's biased is our interpretation of the results because we would be assuming that the difference has to do with the treatment when in fact it might have to do with who got the treatment and who didn't get the treatment. In education, this assumption of no selectivity bias rarely holds. The reason some people get treatments and other people don't get treatments has to do with a lot of things. For example, um, people with economic and social advantages often get experiences and opportunities that people who lack those advantages miss out on. Or people with certain educational problems often get sent to educational interventions that people without those problems don't experience. So <clears throat> there's something systematic about who gets the experience and who doesn't, so we can't just assume that any changes have to do with the treatment. 
So here are a few examples of selectivity in education. One of the best known um, uh, uh, research problems in education is, has to do with class size effects. Um, and uh, there's research suggesting that smaller classes produce higher achievement. But if we're not taking into account why some people get higher, so larger classes and other people get smaller classes, maybe it's that better teachers use their clout to get smaller classes to make their work easier for them. And then what looks like a class size effect might actually be a, I got this small class effect. Or maybe it goes the other way around. Maybe better teachers are more often requested by parents, so they end up with larger classes. And the result we get, uh, the class size effect, we, uh, the class size effect that we get might be even bigger if we didn't have such selectivity going on. Another example selectivity problem, teacher professional development. So we're trying to find out whether teacher professional development makes teachers more effective, produces greater student learning. But participation in teacher professional development is typically voluntary. And so that makes it difficult to distinguish the effects of participation from the effects of who participates and who does not participate. It's the same thing when we're studying Jewish day schools. We have the potential for selectivity bias. Students who attend day schools may come from more Jewishly active families than other students. Or the students themselves may be more committed to Jewish involvement than other students. These conditions make it difficult to distinguish the effects of day schools from the effects of the students and families who choose to attend day schools. We have not solved the fundamental problem of causal inference because we can't observe the same student in the day school condition and the not day school condition at the same time. Now, Russ Whitehurst, who was the first director of the Institute of Education Sciences, used to uh, have a favorite example of selection bias distorting the uh, effects of what people thought was a treatment effect. And this was his example. He, it was a, a research on something called career academies, which are high schools that orient young people for careers. And they have a focused mission and purpose. And there's uh, thought to be more effective. There's a whole bunch of them in New York City. Um, and so someone did a study of career academies and compared them to students in regular comprehensive public high schools using a national survey called the National Educational Longitudinal Survey. That's NELS. Okay, and this is uh, the uh, percent of graduating high school on time for people in this group of career academies compared with students from a national survey who were in either technical programs in the national survey or in the general track. And it looks like uh, the career academies are more effective than these, reg these programs in regular comprehensive high school. But then somebody else came along and did a randomized comparison of students who either went to career academies or went to uh, comprehensive high schools because uh, there weren't enough places in the career academies to accommodate everybody who wanted to go in, and there was a lottery to see who could get into the career academies. So there was a randomized comparison of um, lottery winners and lottery losers. And that comparison showed no difference between the career academy and the students who went to regular public schools when there was a random selection. So what was going on here? In this comparison, the people who went to career academies were special. They were different than the people who were in regular public schools and got stuck in the general track. They were making an active choice trying to seek out a better schooling opportunity. And in fact, that schooling opportunity did not produce anything greater for them than they would have found in the regular public school, where they also would have sought other opportunities to advance themselves. So when we um, don't deal with this problem of selection bias, or even when we deal with it halfway, um, we're liable to get misleading results. So how do we address the selectivity problem? Well, a randomized experiment is the optimal way to rule out selectivity bias. In a randomized experiment, participants are assigned to treatment and control groups at random. So self-selection does not occur. 
and bias is eliminated. U.S. education law calls for randomized trials. No Child Left Design calls for research, or rather, excuse me, the, the Education Sciences Reform Act calls for using rigorous methodological designs and techniques, including control groups and random assignment, to the extent feasible to produce reliable evidence of effectiveness. Now, this is not without controversy. There are some who have, who have raised concerns about uh, randomized trials, but when it comes to measuring impact, there's no substitute for random assignment. So randomized, uh, randomized designs can't solve every problem, and they raise some problems of their own, and I'm going to discuss some of those. But purely for the uh, goal of measuring impact, there's no substitute for the random assignment. Why is experimental research so rare then? If it, if it solves the fundamental problem of causal inference, capital letters, why is it so rare in education research? Well, for a number of reasons. One is that many people view education more as an art than a science. And if you think that education is an art, then studying it scientifically seems to be incompatible with the very essence of the endeavor. A second concern that's sometimes raised is that there is an ethical problem. When you do a randomized comparison, some people get the treatment, other people don't get the treatment. Is that fair? That's a question that's often raised. A third reason that uh, randomized trials are not common is that they are expensive and complicated, and we may not want to pay for them. They're more complicated than just creating a program and letting the people who want to go into that program go in. Um, a fourth problem is that there are trade-offs between internal and external validity. Okay, validity. Validity means, did I really find what I think I found? Do these results really mean what I think they mean? So in the case of an experiment, um, you really know that in this particular instance, the effect that you were measuring is really there. It has strong validity because you know it's not contaminated by selection bias, as I've explained. But do the findings from this experiment apply to other situations? Like I did a study in New York, does that mean it would work in Chicago? Or I did a study in New York City, does that mean it would work in upstate New York? Or I did a study in the United States, does that mean it would apply in Israel? Don't know, because New York is different than Chicago and Madison, Wisconsin, and Israel. And so what, what holds in one place might not hold in another because there could be lots of differences that I haven't taken into account. So external validity is weak, even though internal validity is strong. And I might care a lot about external validity, and the experiment then isn't so good. Um, so despite these problems, as I said before, if we want to measure impact, at least we know what we have when we do an experiment. At least the internal validity is strong. That's the trade-off. Now, what have we learned from recent experiments? So I'm going to go through some uh, recent research in general education, some of which I've been involved with and some of which others have done. And then I'm going to talk about the birthright study that I mentioned at the very beginning and talk about the extent to which that study addressed the fundamental problem of causal inference the extent to which it is an experiment and isn't, and um, uh, offer some comments there, and then um, uh, make my case as far as the kind of research we should be doing in Jewish education and in general education. So uh, to give you the headlines first, uh, what have we learned from recent experiments? Well, first, barriers to co cooperation can be overcome. Um, there's a great need for patience to let results emerge. There's a big pressure to find results really fast, and that can be problematic. We've learned about the importance of implementation. We've learned about the difficulties of scaling up. It's one thing to do a small-scale study with a few participants and a very, something very different to take it to a whole school or a whole school district or, or a whole state. Um, we've learned about limitations to generalizability, taking off from the point that I've already made. Um, OK, so now I'm going to illustrate these points with, uh, with recent work. All right, first of all, will school districts agree to random assignment? Remember, I said not everybody wants to cooperate with this. Well, 
We have found that school districts are increasingly recognizing the need for unbiased assessment of new programs. School districts are paying a lot for new programs, and they're slowly coming around to the notion that if they're bringing on new programs over and over again, it might make sense to find out whether these new programs actually work, whether they're producing uh, higher achievement or whatever the goals of the new programs are. Here's how we deal with the ethical question of denial of treatment. If we know the benefits of the program, it's unethical to conduct an experiment. If we know the benefits, then we should give it to everybody. But if we do not know the benefits of the program, it is unethical not to evaluate it. And yet all too often, um, educators have faith uh, in the value of a program, and so they implement it without ever assessing whether it's bringing about its desired impact. So when we speak with people from school systems, we explain that the most ethical choice in the case where we don't know the effects of the program is to implement it in a way that allows us to, let it, allows us to tell whether, in fact, it is working. Milwaukee, Los Angeles, San Antonio, and Phoenix are all, all examples of school districts that are engaged in pioneering randomized trials that I'm involved with. And there are school districts all over the country, including New York City in a big way, which is participating in randomized experiments. So is, randomized assi is random assignment a denial of services? Not when a program is being phased in, and not if the program is only available because of the research fund. So um, uh, I'll give an example of a program that couldn't do it in all schools at once, so we phase it in. So as long as we're phasing it in, might as well do it in a way that allows us to tell whether it's having an impact. And um, in other cases, uh, we get a grant to do a program in a school district. If we didn't have the grant, nobody in the school district would get the program. Now some of the schools get the program, so it's not a denial of services, it's an extra service. Um, so there are design options that can make randomized trials more palatable to school systems and educators. So one is the treatment and control. Okay, some will get it and some won't. But another is a lag treatment design. So we've got a new program. We're going to give everybody the program, but we're going to not give it to everybody in the first year. We're going to give it to some people in the first year and other people in the second year or the third year. So we're going to lag the implementation of the program so that we can compare those who get it at the beginning to those who get it later to see whether it's having an effect. And, and, and we'll make that selection to the for early treatment or the later treatment by random so that we can have an unbiased comparison. Uh, another kind of um, randomized uh, assessment that may be more palatable is a lottery-based individual assignment. So in the study of New York City charter schools that I mentioned recently, um, more people wanted to go to the charter schools than there were places in the charter school. So, so they selected children to attend the charter schools by lottery. And that's a fair way of doing it since more people wanted to go than, than could. And so uh, not a design, denial of service. Another approach is grade by grade randomization, where so you say, OK, all schools are going to get this program. Some get it in this grade. Others get it in that grade. And then we use the grades that didn't get it in the other schools to make the comparison. So we put it in kindergarten here and in third grade here. And then we take the kindergartens from the school where the program is in third grade as a randomized comparison. So an example of this is the randomized evaluation of Success for All. Success for All is a comprehensive school reform. It's a whole school program designed to boost the achievement of uh, young children in reading and math in the early elementary grades. Uh, it's one of the most widely used uh, comprehensive school programs in the United States. It was started by a Johns Hopkins researcher named Robert Slavin. Um, and my colleague Jeffrey Borman, along with Robert Slavin, recently published the evaluation. Um, so when they, started, they, when they started this evaluation, they said, OK, we're going to offer success for all at half price. And um, we're going to, to invite schools to participate. And then among the schools that agree to participate, we'll choose half to get the program at half price. And the other half will be in the comparison group. And they got almost nobody to sign up. I think there were about six schools that agreed to sign up. So they kept making all sorts of deals to try to increase the, the recruitment. Finally, they ended up with, number one, it was free. 
Number two, all schools got success, all schools that agreed to participate in the study got success for all for free, but some got it in kindergarten, first, and second grade, and others got it in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then they took the kindergarten, first, and second grade in the schools that got the program in third, fourth, and fifth grade, and they used that as their comparison group for the schools that got success for all in kindergarten, first, and second grade. And they randomized who got it in K-1-2, who got it in 3 four, five, so they could have a random comparison of kindergarten, first, and second graders on the impact of success for all. Uh, okay, so that's what I said. Oh, for people on the web, look at the slide, that's what I said. Okay, so the, su the success for all evaluation is an example of a cluster randomized design. By cluster, I mean that schools, not individuals, are randomly assigned. If it's the schools that are randomly assi assigned, then we need a multi-level multi model, a statistical model that recognizes that individuals are clustered within schools in order to test the effects of the Success for All program. The treatment effects, the effects of the program are captured at the cluster level, in this case the level of the school, not the student level. So this is really important because it means that our sample size is the sample of schools not the sample of students. If you look at published research articles, you will see people claiming to do random assignment studies where they randomly assign three schools to the treatment and three schools to the controls, and then they say we have 90 students in the treatment condition and 90 stu students in the control condition, and that's our sample size for comparison. And that's wrong. In fact, you have a sample size of six. So when you do a cluster, uh, cluster randomized design, you need enough clusters, in this case schools, to test the impact of the program. So you need a lot of schools. So in the studies that I'm doing, one study is 52 schools, another study is 80 schools. It's very expensive and complicated to do these cluster randomized design. But a treatment like Success for All, you couldn't assign individuals. It's a whole school program. So there's no way of doing it other than a school randomized study. So uh, these are the findings. Uh, the um, Metric is what's called effect size, and it's the proportion of a standard deviation that, uh, a, uh, and standard deviation is a unit of measure that's relative to a normal curve. Um, one standard deviation is about, the first standard deviation captures about 33%, the second captures about 90% um, of the uh, population. Um, so um, this, the, uh, the bars you're looking at are the difference on four different achievement measures between students in the treatment schools compared to students in the control schools. So you can see that in year one, which was kindergarten, uh, there was a big effect on word attack. You know what word attack is? You look at a word to see if you can figure out what the word says. That's word attack. So a big effect on word attack but no effects on, no significant effects on everything else. And, you know, a couple of them were actually below the line, meaning the coefficients were negative, but for practical purposes, you can, you can uh, consider those to be zero. So year one, benefits on figuring out what words say, nothing else. Okay. Now, if the study ended there, you'd probably say, well, this isn't a very worthwhile program, right? And even into year two, uh, there were some modest effects in other, in other years, it was really only in the word identification measure that the effect was significant. Start, you know, but but uh, effects in um, passage comprehension may be turning around from negative to positive, but still not sure it's really different from zero. It wasn't until year three, when all three of the measures in in, in second grade, word identification, word attack, and passage comprehension, um, were statistically significant, that we could really have confidence that success for all is a beneficial program. And these effect sizes, ranging from 0.2 to 0.3, are um, modest effects, but in education, this is typically about as big as it gets. So this was a successful program. We, we couldn't tell until we did a randomized evaluation and we let it run for three years. The success for all study evaluation, the success for all evaluation illustrates the importance of patient a one-year study would have mixed the results. Now, one thing about Success for All is that it has high fidelity of implementation. Fidelity of implementation, meaning it's implemented the way it's designed to be implemented. It is tightly scripted, 
and instruction can be monitored to see whether teachers are following the script. When I bought my first house, a realtor said to me, Adam, there are three important things about buying a house. Location, location, location. What I've learned about randomized trials is that there are three keys to the successful randomized trial. Implementation, implementation, implementation. If the program is not implemented with fidelity, it will not achieve its desired impact. An example of where this occurred is from a national study of instructional technology. This is instruction that uses technology to um, impart uh, knowledge to young people. There are many small-scale studies that have shown the benefits of technology-based instruction. And yet, a federally sponsored large-scale study conducted by Mathematica showed zero impact. What was going on? Well, implementation was limited. For example, in the middle school math study, implementation averaged 15 minutes per week. So if the program is only happening 15 minutes a week, you can't expect to get much benefit from it. So implementation is really the key to the randomized trial. Now these challenges of patience, implementation, and scaling up are also salient in my own work. Now I'll give the example of a study that we are still undertaking of professional development to improve elementary science teaching and student learning in Los Angeles. The, in, the program that we're studying is called Science Immersion. It's an extended inquiry-oriented science curriculum for grades four and five. It's called Immersion because teachers and students are supposed to be immersed in the practice of doing science. Uh, it involves summer professional development for teachers with ongoing mentoring to help teachers implement this immersion curriculum. And so what we're studying is whether schools where teachers got this professional development to implement the program produce higher test scores than schools where teachers didn't get that professional development. And so I spoke about this study last year in the uh, in the uh, interdisciplinary training program here at NYU. Some, some of you may have been at that time. But now I have two years of results. Um, so it's a question about scaling up. Would this program help science learning throughout the district? The goal is to include all schools, not to cherry pick. So not just to take schools that really want this program, but to take all schools. Now when you do that, you have a real problem, a challenge of implementation. Um, and we were able to include, we wanted to include all the schools. As it turned out, we were able to include about half the schools in our pool for random selection. So that means we can't generalize to all schools in Los Angeles, but our generalization goes much farther than most studies of uh, education programs, which only are, are only implemented in the schools where they really, really want it. For example, Success for All, 75% of teachers have to vote for it before they'll implement it. So that's, that suggests that whatever we learn about Success for All, we can only learn it about schools where they want successful. Here we're trying to say, what would happen if we took this en masse to all schools in Los Angeles? So we got 191 nominations. We randomly selected 80 schools for the study. 40 were randomly assigned to the immersion program. 40 were comparison schools. Um, so the implementation question, would teachers attend the summer professional development? They didn't have to. They were encouraged to do schools, but they weren't required to. Well, we found that 30 of the 40 schools sent fourth grade teachers, and 22 out of 40 schools sent fifth grade teachers, so um, not overwhelming implementation, but uh, in the end, 36 out of 40 schools sent at least one teacher to the program. However, follow-up participation was pretty weak on the part of teachers. Also, immersion is not tightly scripted, unlike the success for all intervention. So there's a lot of looseness, a lot of variation in what teachers actually did with it in the classroom. The findings, well, in the first year, as I reported here at NYU last year, there was an implementation dip, whereas there was no difference in, achieve, in science achievement between treatment and control schools before the, the intervention. In year one, there was lower achievement in the immersion schools. By year two, we have now found equal scores in the immersion and the comparison schools. So here, th here's a graph. The purple line is the school district as a whole. So you can see that in year one, 2005-2006, both the control and the treatment schools were somewhat above the achievement level of the district as a whole. And the uh, control schools in 
improved at the same rate as the district as a whole, but the treatment schools got worse. But by year two, 2007, 2008, the treatment schools made a big jump and have nearly caught up to the control schools. So here's the mystery. Is it, did this catch up happen because the treatment teachers got a better handle on this new program? They're able to manage it well and use it more effectively? Or having used it one year and gotten poor results, did they say, well, this is no good? and abandon it and go back to business as usual. So that's what we're working on right now. The, our preliminary results using observations and the interviews suggest that some of both was going on. Um, implementation, the use of immersion went from 80% in year one to 30% in year two, so that suggests a lot of abandonment. But 26% uh, of teachers in immersion schools were still using immersion a lot in year two. So probably some of both was going on. And we're awaiting results for year three now. Um, another lesson from the experience with experiments, including the one that I conducted, is about the importance of using educators, of including educators in schools as partners in the research. We cannot impose these interventions on educators. They're very likely to fail. Implementation will succeed only with buy-in from school staff. And study recruitment often requires school system partnership. Now, I mentioned earlier that experiments are strong on internal validity, but weak on external validity, meaning we can have confidence in our judgment about cause and effect, but not whether the effect would generalize to other places. And I'll give one final example that illustrates this point, and this is about the research on class size. You may have heard of the famous Tennessee STAR experiment. STAR stands for Student-Teacher Achievement Ratio, and it was a statewide randomized trial in Tennessee to see whether small classes would produce higher test scores. And in fact, the experiment showed that smaller classes did boost achievement in kindergarten and first grade. The effects were sustained in later grades, although they didn't increase any further. However, similar efforts to reduce classes statewide in California and Florida have failed. And they failed for different reasons. In Florida, they failed because not enough money was allocated. You know how it is when the legislature passes a law, but then they don't put the money in to actually implement the law? That's what happened in Florida. In California, they passed the law, and they tried to implement it, but they didn't have enough trained teachers, right? If you have smaller classes, you need more teachers, right? So they didn't have enough trained teachers, so the quality of teachers got worse, even though the classes got smaller. And moreover, they didn't have space. Smaller classes need more rooms to put the kids in, right? So they were putting kids in trailers, because they didn't have the classroom for it. So you combine smaller classes with worse teachers, and uh, inadequate space, you end up with no benefits of small classes. Similarly, the national survey analyses have also find, failed to find class size effects. And one wonders is that due to unobserved selectivity, right, selectivity bias, as I discussed before, or is it that the experiment in Tennessee doesn't generalize to the nation as a whole? So we used the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study, which is a national survey of the kindergarten class of 1988, and we compared teachers who had two kindergarten classes, one bigger and one smaller. So we know that those biases that I described earlier, you know, the better teachers getting the smaller classes, or maybe the better teachers getting more kids so they have the bigger classes, we can rule those out because it's the same teachers. And we find no difference in student achievement between the small class and the large class, suggesting that maybe the findings from Tennessee don't generalize to the nation, perhaps because the same kind of resources that were implemented in Tennessee don't occur in the more general case. Okay, now uh, implications for uh, Jewish education. Well, we run immediately to the recent birthright study by Leonard Sachs and his colleagues at Brandeis, which have indicated the positive effects of birthright in Israel, as illustrated by those three headlines that I pulled out at the beginning of my talk. Uh, in case there's somebody in the room or on the web, I doubt there is, who hasn't heard about this, uh, I'll just uh, tell you a few of the highlights. Birthright participants exhibited a 23% greater likelihood of having a sense of connection to Israel. They were 50% more likely to feel, quote, very confident, unquote, of their ability to explain the current situation in Israel. <coughs> they were 22% more likely to belong to a congregation. This is uh, uh, 48 years after birthright. 
and they were 57% more likely to have a Jewish spouse. And that finding is limited to married non-Orthodox respondents. So these, were, these are very striking findings, very important. Um, and it's a natural experiment. By natural experiment, I mean that it's a comparison of applicants who attended to applicants who did not. Everybody in this study applied to birthright. However, some attended and some did not attend. So already we're getting some purchase. It's not just people who went on birthright to the general Jewish population. That would have been a big source of selectivity bias, which is ruled out. Um, at the same time, the trade-off is that this is limited in its generalizability. The findings only pertain to young people who were of the sort to apply to birthright. So these findings that I presented in the previous slide doesn't necessarily mean that you could pluck any Jew at random, send them on birthright, and get those same results. It applies to those who are likely to, who are who are similar to those who actually applied to birthright. However, there's been over a quarter of a million young people who have now gone on birthright. So even though I'm saying generalizability is limited, that's a big pool. That's a lot of people who have been influenced. So. Um, gen uh, generalizability is limited, but it's limited in a very, uh, to a very large population. So um, I think we found something very important uh, that it generalizes to a large fraction of the young Jewish population of the United States. So the key question here then is not one about generalizability. It's one about whether this is an unbiased comparison. Has the birthright study solve the fundamental problem of causal inference. Among the applicants are those who went the same as those who didn't go. That's the fundamental question. Are those who went equivalent to those who didn't go? So the main reason, according to the report, the main reason for attending, or rather for not attending among those who, were, who applied, was that the timing of dates offered for the trip was inconvenient. So if times of dates were offered at random, then it might be a randomized comparison. Um, according to the report, quote, the selection process was more or less random. So that sounds like it was kind of random, but maybe kind of not random. So more details would be, would be very helpful. Um, why did some people get more desirable dates than others? Was it first come, first serve? Was there a priority to get certain people in and certain people not? Let, you know, was there less priority to others? Um, what, were the, what was the decision basis for which dates were offered to which people? And what reason besides the convenience of dates was there for why some applicants went and some didn't? Of course, the big fear here is that people who were more committed were the ones who went given that they applied. And so that would mean that the effects we observed could be due to the same kind of things that led person, one person to actually go and one person to not go, as opposed to the effects of the program itself. So that, that's what we're trying to uh, settle out, feel confident. OK, so the researchers uh, made a number of efforts to try to address this problem. First of all, they found that there were no differences on observable indicators that distinguish the participants from non-participants, except for age. Now, I want to explain a couple of terms here. Observable. Observable means a term that has the condition that has been measured. Now, you know, when we say observable, we're kind of implying that, well, it could have, we're kind of implying that it could have been observed. Actually, we mean it was observed. And it's contrasted with, oh, so examples of observables in this study and many studies are age, gender, denomination, and so on. Um, it's contrasted with unobservable. It sounds like we couldn't possibly have measured it, but actually it means we didn't measure it in this study. Um, and so these are things like motivation and commitment that are very difficult to measure independently of the behavioral manifestations. Uh, and so it's, um, uh, it's typical for education studies to have many unobservables, many conditions that were not observed and yet which might have been associated with the decision to participate or not participate. Observables can be addressed with statistical methods. Unobservables are much harder to deal with. In the birthright study, there were no differences on observables other than age. 
So Jewish schooling, gender, ritual practices, and so on, you can read about it in the report. These were all equivalent, and age can be taken into account since it was measured. So, uh, so the study does a good job of dealing with these observed conditions. What about unobservables? Motivation, commitment, interest in being Jewish, exploring Israel. Involvement in non-Jewish activities, maybe the people who went on the trip were the ones who didn't have a lot of other things going on compared to the people who didn't go on the trip. Maybe they had more other things going on, and that's why they didn't go to, on the trip. And these other things going on in your life could be related to what happens to you four to eight years later, and it might be some, that rather than or in addition to the program that's creating these effects. Uh, and so we don't know that. It wasn't observed. It's one of the unobservables. If the inconvenient timing of the trips was the main reason for non-participation, who got preferred dates and why? But also, um, maybe the people who went and the people who didn't went got similar dates, but for the people who didn't go, those similar dates were inconvenient because maybe they had a lot of other things going on. Or maybe they were in college and the other people weren't in college. Uh, you no, know, it, 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 we just don't know. It's not observed. These differences in such unobserved characteristics may bias the results. Uh, so I want to emphasize that this is a, a really important study that goes much farther than most studies in trying to deal with conditions that may um, lead some people to be in the treatment group and others in the comparison group, and yet uh, concerns remain. And if there are additional concerns, uh, most important, uh, aside from the this uh, pro challenge of answering the fundamental problem of causal inference, uh, the most important concern has to do with differential response rates. 61.8% um, of participants responded to the follow-up survey compared to 42.3% of non-participants. This is a very large difference, almost 50% greater response rate among the participants compared to non-participants. Now this is addressed with weighting, so that the, the uh, uh, study uh, leaders uh, weighted the sample, that is, gave additional weight to some people among the non-participants who were like those who, did who didn't respond to make the number, to project up so the numbers are similar. But weighting only solves the problem of differential response weights if, the, if, the, if there are no other differences between the respondents and the non-respondents. So um, there's an assumption here that among the respondents, we have people who are very like the non-respondents. And if we weight them properly, then we'll have a sample that matches the treatment group. But that's based on assumptions about information that we lack. What reasons were given for non-response? Well, the first was no contact. We couldn't find the people. And that affected 26% of participants, but a greater percentage, 30% of non-participants. Second, lack of cooperation. Only 6.4% of participants failed to cooperate, whereas almost 20% of non-participants failed to cooperate. So it seems likely that there are some differences between participants and non-participants, possibly related to the program, which could distort the results, which could distort the comparisons we're making between um, conclusions for the participants and the non-participants. Now, the interesting thing about differential response is that it could bias the results in either direction. For example, suppose these non-participants didn't participate because they're not interested in Jewishness, and so they got this survey question uh, from this Jewish organization or asking about a, a Jewish um, participation, Jewish involvement, and they weren't interested in answering it. Or maybe they feel guilty about not going to synagogue, so they didn't want to participate. That would bias the results in a direction that would mean that the actual differences between participants and non-participants was even greater than what was observed in the birthright study. So this differential response could, in fact, lead to an underestimate of the impact of birthright. Or it could, it could have gone in the opposite direction. It could be <clears throat> that the reason for non-participants was because the non-participants either were um, more 
active, meaning they're moving around more, maybe they're going to graduate school, they're, they're um, changing, they're moving town, they're changing towns, they're um, involved in other activities, and so they couldn't find them or they were, they were too busy to respond, and maybe they would have been more involved in, uh, in uh, Jewish activities or, or, or other things, and so, uh, or, or other related things that were part of the positive side of the birthright result, so the bias could go in the other direction. It's just hard to tell. So differential response could bias the results in either way. Uh, finally, <clears throat> this, is a, this is a concern that deals with the, only with the findings about um, in marriage versus intermarriage. And this is censoring on marriage. This study captures people who married young. Okay, remember the, the marriage results that are reported in the study, the main results are limited to non-Orthodox married people. Obviously, you can't ask who your spouse is if you're not married. Um, and even though, um, and, and in marriage rates may differ for those who marry older. So this study captures people who marry young. It could be that people who marry older uh, have different in marriage rates, and then we would get a misleading conclusion from looking only at the people who marry young. For this reason, the intermarriage findings should be treated with particular caution. And, and I say this recognizing that the study actually um, intentionally selected an overrepresentation of participants who were 30 and older to deal with exactly this problem, to make sure they had enough married people to answer questions about marriage rates. But nonetheless, 30 is still a young age. There are a lot of people who are going to get married who at age 30 have not yet married. And so if intermarriage and in-marriage rates are different for older people than they are for younger people, then we don't know yet what the effects of birthright are on intermarriage rates. So this concern pertains only to the question of intermarriage. So is the birthright study an experiment? Well, it's closer to an experiment than most research in Jewish education because all the participants in the study are people who applied to birthright. So we've ruled out a big source of potential bias. And therefore, it deserves special attention. Yet, we have to recognize that it has limited generalizability and potential problems due to non-random selection and differential response rates. Now, could the birthright study have been conducted as a true experiment? Yes, it could have, if it had been set up that way. For many years, birthright have been oversubscribed. More people want to go on birthright than there are places to accommodate them at any given point in time. Instead of first come, first serve, establish a deadline, and then take all of those who have applied by the deadline and conduct a lottery to select who's accommodated and who isn't accommodated. That would have ruled out bias due to unobserved, not only observed, but unobserved characteristics. And the second thing that would have helped a lot is to get better contact information to reduce non-response rates among non-participants. With those two elements, it could have been a true experiment. But like I said, uh, it has a lot of virtues over uh, what's commonly done. So in conclusion, I think this review of experimental methods and their increasing use in general education and the extent to which the best studies in Jewish study education are approaching experimental designs suggest the following conclusions. First, with all the advances in curricula and teaching methods, we should be asking some what works questions. Second, though not always feasible, randomized trials are the optimal method for answering these questions about what works and what doesn't. And finally, there are many pitfalls in executing randomized trials, but the potential benefits make the effort worthwhile. Thank you. I'd be happy to take your questions, and for people on the web, I understand you have a chance to type in your questions, and there's someone who's uh, going to read them out to me. But let's take a question from the people who are here first. Not 
So those, those are two excellent questions. Oh, sure. So there, there was a twofold question. The first question was, you know, there's not that many day schools and there's not that much oversubscription. So how are we going to do randomized, how practical is it to talk about randomized trials for day schools? And the second question was, um, there's a lot of, and correct me if I don't uh, paraphrase this, this properly, but uh, there's a lot of variation within schools, so there's a lot that depends on who the teacher is and what they're interested in, and so how can we really study the effects of a program? Is that, I get it, well, okay, so I have a good answer to the first question and not such a good answer to the second question. So here's the good answer. Uh, both, both of these are really good questions. Um, the answer to the first question is uh, two, also two parts. Part A is um, when I call for randomized evaluations in Jewish education, I'm not so much calling for an effect of attending day school versus not attending day school. Rather, I'm calling for research that looks at the effectiveness of programs that are used in day schools, um, innovations in day school education. Uh, innovations having to do with curriculum and instruction and teacher professional development, the same things that we're seeing in general education. So that kind of randomized evaluation is possible. There are enough day schools to, uh, to do those kinds, especially if we look at things like curriculum programs or professional development for teachers that can be implemented within schools, maybe not at the student level, but at the teacher level or the program level. So that, that's the first uh, comment. Um, that's part A of my response to that question. Part B is, um, now, if, if the question is, what's the benefit of attending a day school versus not attending a day school, that's a great example of a study that you really can't do with a randomized design for exactly the reason you mentioned. There aren't enough day schools and isn't enough oversubscription to do a lottery study of that. Uh, and so for that, and, and um, I've used this example more generally talking about the effects of religious schools Versus pub, versus public comprehensive public non-religious schools, um, which is a big topic in general education, um, and so for that there are statistical methods that try to even out at least observable indicators, try to simulate an experimental design uh, that falls short of the randomized trial in ruling out selection bias, but do better than our typical designs to try to to answer that question. Um, and I got a whole other lecture on that, and uh, maybe I'll come back sometime and talk about that. Um, that would fall under the heading of quasi-experimental designs. Um, with respect to your second question, I think that's a great challenge. But that is a challenge not so much for the study of educational programs, but for the improvement of educational programs more generally. The fact that uh, education generally and Jewish education in particular, is so decentralized, and there's so much autonomy, so that when the classroom door is shut, the teacher does whatever she wants, that's a major challenge to education reform. How can you leverage improvement when there's so little influence that can be exerted from the principal or the uh, system? Uh, and in a study I did a couple of years ago, appeared in Jewish Education, the Journal of Jewish Education, I showed that um, Jewish schools have particularly high levels of perceived autonomy compared to other private schools and especially compared to public schools. And that presents a great challenge. And my answer for that, my answer for that challenge was, therefore, teacher professional development is the only viable solution for improving uh, teaching and learning in Jewish schools. I don't know if that's right, but that was, that was the answer I tried for that. Um, OK, another question, uh, Steve? <coughs> Um, this question I've been working on for 41 years. So I thought it was years. And then now 42? Uh, next week. <laughs> um, and how do you deal with that? There was one of the slides that said educators need the answer now. And we have defective research all over the place. So as a researcher, the person who wants to make a difference, wants to contribute the policy, how do you decide how to speak about your research knowing without having any of your colleagues tell you that you are working with research that is defective, that has shortcomings, that is far from ideal, and yet you want to be able to participate in the, in the real world. If you come out too strongly, you're 
colleagues and your own heart will tell you, ah, you owe, you've oversold this. If you say nothing, then how do you get up in the morning and go back and do your business? Yeah. So uh, for the folks on the web, the question is, how do we as researchers speak to educators when we recognize that our research is imperfect and yet they have to make decisions based on whatever information they can get? Um, I have two answers to that question, too. Uh, first of all, one thing that distinguishes me from the most zealous experimental design people is that I think that we should use whatever information we have to make decisions because we have to make decisions. So there are some people who will tell you uh, we shouldn't be supplying any information unless we have a lot of confidence that that information is accurate. But my view is we should supply the information that's the best we have at the time we have it and uh, present it acknowledging that this might be wrong, but the best I know is X. And the second part of my answer to that question uh, goes back to my research on tracking. You know, when kids are placed in the honors or the remedial class, depending on their achievement level, and then it turns out that kids in the honors class m learn more and kids in the remedial class learn less. So I've spoken with a lot of groups of educators about this question. They always want to know thumbs up or thumb down, yes or no, about tracking. And it, what I learned is they don't really want to, they don't really want to know what I found. They want to know what did I find that fits with their preconceived decision about what they want to do. So I learned to deal with this by saying um, this is a challenging issue and there are advantages to doing one way and advantages to doing the other way. And here's what typically happens when we do it this way and here's what typically happens when we do it that way and you know your own context best and, and you have to decide. So I you know, pre present it with some humility but I don't hesitate to say this is the best we know at the present time because I think that something we know is better than going with nothing. Um, building on Steve's question, if you will, really, on your last answer, which I agree with about using the best information you can, uh, I thought your, your presentation presented a lot of the major the problems and if anything it stopped short of all the others that face research, such as um, logic looking at impacts over time, which is what most of them want, in, in many cases, want to see. Um, what could go on? The, the, the problem that I, I think you illuminate goes even deeper is that we're, in, in the case of education, but not alone, uh, the demand for evidence base sort of assumes that it's possible to have a, a kind of what I call a pharmaceutical model a single dimension. And the best examples you gave were single dimensional kinds of interventions, which is not always the case. Um, other complexities relate to the implementation of the evaluation, not, not just the, uh, uh, and then um, there is the instance or, or the, the situation of large scale um, interventions where it might tend to be more of that. But most of them are not. So um, we're sort of faced with the pragmatics, I think you address that in part, that most things that one wants to do are very small scale, uh, limited resources, and if I would I think one way from what you presented, one might conclude that there's no point in even attempting to evaluate anything that is not up to a certain point of scale resources, which I would not accept. Okay, so, all, all so let me... So the, the point then, I want to go back to your first point, um, and follow, uh, uh, follow up with your second point, which is that the problem is So that, that's a, a great comment, and the, 
what I want to focus on in answering, I, I took to be the heart of your comment, which is that many, many times we want to evaluate, we want to implement change in a small scale way. And are you really saying, and you said you wouldn't say this, and, and I think you recognize I wouldn't say this, but you could, if, you, if you pushed what I said, you would, you would say, well, you shouldn't bother to evaluate it, or maybe even shouldn't bother to do it because you can't, do, you can't evaluate it in a, in a rigorous large-scale randomized trial. So uh, a, as you are inferring, I, I, would not, I would not take that position. And on the contrary, what I would say in response is, in that kind of situation where you're implementing something you're trying to change at a small scale, it's incumbent, it's incumbent on you to try to study it and be reflective on it, re reflective about it, and try to disseminate information about it. Because those small scale studies are what furnish the grist for the larger mill of educational evaluation. So it's only because we try things out on a small scale and we see what seems to work. And we um, put that in dialogue with our theory of how things work, that we can come up with programs that are worth evaluating. One of the problems with a lot of educational evaluation now is that, uh, to quote one person from a review panel, these evaluations seemed like they were dreamed up over breakfast. You know, there, there's not a lot of thought given to the programs. And, um, you know, that happens whether there's evaluations or there's not evaluations. So, and so if we could be reflective about these small-scale programs, they could um, stimulate the development of sensible programs that are both theoretically sound and uh, have some grounds for thinking practically they're workable, they're feasible, and then that would be worth sink, sinking the very large investments into for a rigorous uh, evaluation. Okay, one, two, three. I got a lot of questions. One, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, in the birthright case study, and from another perspective, that is the birthright project was celebrated by the Jewish community way before these results came in. I've been in multiple Jewish conversations, communal, local, in which there was already a declared uh, label of this is a successful project before the results were coming in, preliminary results were the more advanced results. So in some way, the results were not interesting to the, to the stakeholders because there was a sense that something really good is going on, primarily because of the numbers, secondly because of the excitement that uh, resulted from the, from the consumer or participant satisfaction from the actual programs, and thirdly because there was a well-run machinery. That is how we have results okay. and, and shed a much more sustained light on this thing. How do these two, two processes interact with one another? Well, that's, that's a good comment. It's interesting that um, the number of participants and consumer satisfaction were very high and very positive. So that, in fact, should be taken as preliminary evidence that something good is going on. And the fact that the birthright um, pr um, uh, supporters um, uh, supported a more rigorous evaluation that would go on, that would go beyond participation rates and satisfaction indices is to their credit. You know, I, I've heard people saying, well, you can't trust the birthright evaluation because the same people who fund birthright also funded the evaluation. I don't, I don't see it that way. I mean, I, you know, there would be a value in, a, in, an, independent, in an evaluation that was not funded by, by the birthright funders, but I think we also have to give the birthright funders some credit for being willing to subject their program to uh, to an evaluation with, with some uh, rigor to it. If you'll be rigorous because what you said is absolutely wrong and it needs to be corrected. From the very beginning, the very first cohort of mice, there were randomized evaluations and the first evaluations came in six months afterwards. They were positive and uh, they continued. The findings that you recorded here have been basically the same year after year after year in fact of born. Okay, let, let, uh, so can we get... So that the, the statement that the excitement was there because they liked it, the thought they may have been quite for a lot of reasons and continue to be, but the 
by right from the back from the very beginning. Okay, yeah, let's get back to our kids. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, let's say that, um, okay, so, Yeah, excellent. And uh, so this is a question about do we have enough of a basis for engaging in randomized trials in Jewish education? And if we don't, what do we need to do to, do to get there? So um, I'm going to strike the same line that the Institute of Education Sciences has taken. Uh, the Institute of Education Sciences came in with a campaign to do randomized trials, but it's turned out that they've supported relatively few randomized trials, and most of the grants from the Institute of Education Sciences are in what they call goal two, which is development of programs that could later be tested with randomized trials. And I think that's what we need in Jewish education as well. We need the research base to be cumulative so that we can design programs with theory behind them and develop the kind of small-scale data that will allow us to assess the feasibility of implementing and the plausibility that the effects may be there that we think are there. And um, when things don't work, we get judgments of why they're, why they're not working on, in a small-scale developmental process. And then that would accumulate to enough knowledge that we would say, OK, now we've done this in a few schools, and it seems to be working. Let's take it to scale. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because that's really lacking in Jewish education. This was, uh, the, Amy's follow-up question is about what IES would call the goal one studies, where you take a large, a nationally representative longitudinal study and you generate hypotheses about what experiences or what programs might work to produce desired results. We can't do that in Jewish education because we don't have the large-scale, la broadly representative longitudinal studies. And if we could have such studies, we would go a long way towards generating hypotheses about experiences and programs that may be effective. And I, I think maybe if I were going to pick one thing, that might be the thing that I would pick uh, for, for investment over the next 10 years. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, let me just take Bethany's, and then we'll go to the web, OK? My question was more about the kind of outcome measure that get used in the educational uh, studies. And um, I, it, it, just since you're doing a comparison of what gets done, done in education generally as compared to what goes on in Jewish education, I think it's interesting that this, the birthright study used uh, intermarriage as an outcome. And I don't see something really comparable going on unless it's like chances <laughs> in the general world. And I'm, I'm interested also because Steve asked question earlier and the things that kind of come up in conversation around some of the articles that have been written is treating the conditions going in. In other words, you should be against intermarriage 
uh, try to reduce intermarriage going into the education. You know, in other words, what are you treating, the effect or the cause? I, I didn't ask this one, but um, I, 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 I feel that um, there is some, uh, well, it's like cutting down on intermarriage may be a goal of the Jewish community. I don't know that it's a goal of Jewish education. And is it, I guess I'm, I'm asking, is there a way to, do you have something to say about these kind of other okay. so, into the okay. first right, and maybe you can turn that into a question, but that's the, so that's this the is, gist of what you're getting. This is the question about the outcomes of these research studies yeah. and whether they are synchronized with the goals of the program. Thank you. That's a whole and, <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, <laughs> in fact, it's very common that we evaluate education programs on goals that they weren't meant to accomplish. And that's a big problem. For example, my study of science professional development with the immersion, the inquiry-based teaching, the kids are being assessed on a paper and pencil multiple choice test, not very inquiry-based. So the people who do the program will criticize my study by saying, well, that's not the kind of science learning that we we're trying to influence anyway. The problem in that case, and I think it's relevant to this, in that case, yeah, but the outcome we're using is the one that matters. So if your program, however good it is, can't influence this high-stakes test that we're being held accountable for, then we're, the school district is not going to want to run your program. And similarly, if uh, Jewish funders and the Jewish world more generally is interested in um, uh, preserving uh, Jewish in marriage because something they've observed about it makes it valued, uh, then even if that's not what the program was designed to do, there's still going to be great interest mm -hmm. in assessing the impact of that program on that outcome. Okay, internet questions. Okay, here, okay, are, here are two questions, questions from our web participants. Number one, uh, actually, I, why, don't, why don't you come up? Can you bring your laptop up there? My, my laptop is unmuted. And oh, but the can audio, they hear? They can hear? Oh, they great. Can hear. Thanks. Okay, so this is asked by Shira Hecht. What role do you see qualitative research playing, if any, in this endeavor, i.e., discovering what works? And the second question I want to share, at least right now, is from Harriet Hartman. Could you recommend some research that should be done on Jewish education, not just birthright? Sure. Okay. So with respect to the first question, uh, thank you for bringing up the question of um, qualitative research. I think qualitative research has a big role to play in these studies. Uh, in our research, we are doing a lot of qualitative research, including um, uh, observations of what's happening in classrooms and interviews with teachers and principals and school district officials. The reason we have to do qualitative research is because the hypothesis testing work doesn't tell us anything about meaning. It doesn't tell us what these experiences mean to the participants. And because of that, it's weak on answering questions about why. Why does it work? Why does it not work? For example, in my study of science professional development, um, we know that Things didn't look as bad in year two as they did in year one, but we want to know why. What decisions were teachers making? And we're using our interviews and our classroom observations to try to answer those questions. And I think more generally, we need to build in qualitative elements within these large-scale quantitative studies to help us understand uh, why participants are making the decisions they make, um, how they experience these activities, and um, how they perceive uh, the results. Um, with respect to examples of research on Jewish education that should be done, well, I'm going to take off from, from Amy Schwartz's uh, comment. I'm going to say that the research we should do is a um, representative, large-scale, longitudinal study of Jewish youth as they move through experiences of Jewish schooling and Jewish not schooling so that we can compare people who have one kind of experience versus another, those who go to day school, those who don't, those who go to camp, those who don't, those who go on Israel trips, those who don't, those who take Jewish courses in college, those who don't, those who belong to congregations, those who don't, those who marry Jews, those who don't, those who do youth groups, those who don't, and then that will allow us to generate the hypotheses that we can later test through these um, 
studies that are well designed for answering causal questions. So that is not a study, that is not a plan for testing cause and effect. It is a plan for figuring out what we should be then later testing through cause and effect designs. Thank you, Harriet, for that question. Right. Um, and my question is, you know, Marshall McLuhan sitting in a room, uh, I think Professor Charles Dushin is one of the senior authors of the study that you can study a lot of time on. I just would like to give, give Charles a chance to, if you have any, any comments you'd like to make in light of this presentation that could, yeah. could help us understand the, the issues of the Sure. Uh, I did want to, again, partly apologize my quick intervention, but when people say So this is a very interesting two-part question, one having to do with uh, for a Jewish educator or social entrepreneur who gets grants, um, some evaluation is required, but it is necessarily very small scale and limited. And then uh, second, for perhaps the most innovative work, there is no existing research that supports it, or perhaps the one study that's been done has um, failed to support it, and then how can you get the money from the funder? The funders are very cost funds. So with respect to the first, I think um, uh, I think that I would press funders to be more judicious about where they're asking for research and where not. I would, I would like to see them put more money into more research for fewer projects mm -hmm. 
rather than try to do a little drop, you know, a little satisfaction survey for every for every project. So um, greater depth and fewer studies rather than very shallow in a lot of studies. For your second, I think here I'm more likely to side with the funders than with the social entrepreneurs. I'm going to say that in the situation you describe, where there is no research that supports it, or even negative research, that more money should be invested in research before the intervention is tried. So if, um, if they won't fund your intervention because there's no research that demonstrates it, then design a research project and try to get that funded and demonstrate that, uh, that impact before uh, trying to you know, go forward with the, with the intervention. I was, I was rather, I, I, there were a lot of things that has happened today that's been surprising. But I was most surprised when I opened my Blackberry and I found out that you'd be speaking for an hour and a half. Um, which means that I really, and I, I for one, have really enjoyed it. You, you have, a, you have a, uh, an audience here that has stuck through it. But I want to, um, so I, I know we can, we can continue, but I have, a, I have a sense that all good things should come to an end. And, and this is unless there's somebody out there you really well, I, want to. I just wonder if the people on the web, we only like to answer two questions. Well, do they have any more or are they done? They don't pay for the institution. What do we care? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we really have a, but we really have, it's, it's, you really you want to do this. Fine. <laughs> so is there, is there one brilliant question on the web that you want to um, uh, send our way? And then we'll, I think we'll find out. Um, okay. Have you encountered any studies, any studies in Jewish education that do constitute rigorous experiments? Uh, I think the Bergwort study that we've been discussing today is the closest. Um, the, uh, at least as a large-scale study. There are probably smaller-scale studies that I'm just not aware of. Um, until the birthright study, I used to cite a study by Steve Cohen, 1995, which used a survey um, to compare the effects of Jewish education on Jewish identification. And what I liked about that study was that it was a two-generation study. So he had answers from the parents about their Jewish background, and he could take that into account in an effort to equalize the Jewish backgrounds of the young people who experience various kinds of Jewish education. So that was my previous example of, of uh, uh, rigorous uh, control. Um, the birthright study, I think, as uh, Charles put it, is a quasi-experimental, but not quasi-experiment in the term we usually use. It's, it's, it's close to, an ex it's certainly as close to a large-scale experiment as we've had in Jewish education. There are probably smaller scale uh, experiments in Jewish education that I'm simply not aware of. Well, I'm very glad we had that question and answer. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. We really, we really should kind of wind up. So thank, thank you very, very much, Adam. It was really a, a, a great joy. Thank you. Really, we, really, we learned a lot of this. Yeah. So thank you. This was really cool. Thank you. Really, really yeah. Yeah. Oh my god.